to be where everyone's watching from. Um, so this talk is called Massively Scalable Real-Time Geospatial Data Processing with Apache Kafka and Cassandra. Uh, and thanks for accepting it in the geospatial track. I think this is the first time I've spoken at an ApacheCon geospatial track. Um, I've talked at a few other tracks uh, last year. So it's, it's always interesting at ApacheCon, I tend to jump around between tracks because I follow whatever is interesting. So hopefully this talk is interesting for you guys. Um, I'm Paul Brebner. I'm actually a technology evangelist at InstaCluster. Um, in my previous life, I used to be a computer scientist. I worked for CSIRO and NICTA and a few other university-based organizations. Um, and I have had some contact with the OGC technologies and standards, um, but that was quite a long time ago. So this is my first attempt at doing anything geospatial for about 15 years. So I hope it's... Um, interesting for you guys and at sort of the right right level. Um, it was more or less about my experiences trying to add some geospatial aspects to a system that I'd already built. So let's go. Um, InstaCluster is a company founded in Canberra uh, about seven years ago. Um, we've got most of our um, development staff here still, um, but we do have quite a lot of people around the world and we're all about reliability at scale. Um, we basically provide a managed service on cloud platforms for a whole bunch of open source software, including Cassandra and Kafka, which is the focus of today's talk. Uh, and some new offerings include Elasticsearch and Redis and an old favorite, which is Spark. So the, this talk's basically uh, as follows. Um, briefly, we're going to have a look at, at uh, a location in the news this year. Um, have a look at the anomaly detection application and the baseline throughput. Uh, we'll add some uh, spatial data to that to turn it into a spatial anomaly detection problem. And then the, the bulk of the talk is really looking at some different solutions that I tried, uh, some of which are uh, pretty bad and others which are a lot better. But basically, how did we add location uh, for the querying and indexing part of the application? And there's a whole bunch of alternative options that we'll have a look at there. So in the news this year, unfortunately, the famous uh, computer scientist, John Connolly, passed away. Uh, what was he famous for? Well, lots of things. But probably what he's best known for is the game of life. So this is a cellular automata. Uh, the, the next state for each cell depends entirely on the state of the immediate neighbors. So that's a very uh, locality-based problem. Now, it's got very simple rules, but you can end up with some quite complex patterns. Uh, also in the news, unfortunately, of course, with the pandemic, um, this fellow here is uh, demonstrating Uncle Ron's social distancing 3000 invention. That's a good example of New Zealand uh, ingenuity. Uh, other countries have tried something a bit more um, sophisticated, including lots of different um, tracing applications which all, of course, re re rely on either proximity or actual absolute location information to work. Uh, probably something that people have forgotten about now, but we almost all got wiped out by a planet killer asteroid, uh, which um, only just missed us definitely earlier in the year. So location does matter. Um, so this time last year, I was giving some talks at ApacheCon in the US and then later in Berlin. Uh, the title of that talk was uh, Kafka, Cassandra, and Kubernetes at Scale, Real-Time Anomaly Detection on 20 Billion Events a Day. Uh, so this talk is basically an extension of that one. So anomaly detection, what was the problem? Well, essentially, I built a system to spot the difference at speed. Uh, so it was real-time. We wanted to detect um, if there was an anomaly in under one second and scale. So it had to be very high throughput with lots of data and highly scalable. But it's a very simple uh, algorithm that we use. We wanted to emphasize the, the data layer rather than the processing layer. Um, there's a cumulative sum control chart. It's a technique actually dating back to the 60s. Uh, uses statistical analysis of historical data. Uh, the data is for a single variable or key at a time, uh, which makes it highly efficient. Uh, but there are potentially billions of keys. 
Um, so for every new event coming in, you have to look at previous events and make a decision about whether the new one um, is, is significantly different to the old ones. Um, the application that I built used Kafka, Cassandra, and Kubernetes clusters. Kafka handles the streaming, sort of the real-time part. Cassandra uh, is for the data storage, and Kubernetes coped with the application scaling. Um, Cassandra is very efficient for writes and reads uh, with a simple key. And I used a unique account ID or something similar um, for that for an application domain. Uh, the events are time series. Uh, oh, so, so for Cassandra, it's very important to get the data model right. I'm not a Cassandra data model expert, so I, I did have to um, uh, make a few false starts to get this all working. Um, but for this problem, the events are pretty obviously time series. Um, the ID is a partition key in the Cassandra terminology, and time is the clustering key, which is the ordering part of the, the information. Um, for every read of Cassandra, we get the most 50 uh, recent values for the ID, and it's very fast to be able to do that. So here's an example of the, um, the table that we created in Cassandra to support this, uh, and the query to, to get um, the, the 50 values back for a particular ID. Um, I thought it was interesting just to see how big the final setup was. Uh, the previous talk went into a lot more detail about how we actually scaled it up from a very small system up to um, sort of an arbitrary size. And this is where we stopped. We could have kept on going, but we used um, 574 cores in total on running on AWS. Uh, Cassandra by far used the, the bulk of those at 384 cores, uh, followed by the actual application pipeline running on Kubernetes at 118. And then Kafka is by far the most efficient part of the system. It's really all it, all it has to cope with is um, uh, the incoming events and then uh, passing them on to the rest of the pipeline. So that used 72 cores. So that gives you a bit of a feel for the size of the system. Um, it's, it's certainly not the biggest um, system like this that we've built, and a lot of our customers have uh, even bigger systems as well, and, and some other commercial users of Cassandra and Kafka have even bigger clusters again. <coughs> However, that system, uh, without any geospatial key, just using the very simple key, has a baseline throughput of 19 billion anonymously checks a day. So we'll call that the normalized 100% level. And then any changes from now on, we'll see uh, whether it makes any difference to that baseline throughput. So I thought an interesting um, and potentially harder problem without knowing what I was getting myself into was to spot the differences in the space. So space is big, um, obviously really big. Um, so it just adds another dimension to the temporal dimension that I already was dealing with. Uh, and you can also have spatial anomalies. Um, according to the, the um, Star Trek Wikipedia, there's quite a whole bunch that have appeared in Star Trek over the years. They're always encountering spatial anomalies of some sort. So I thought, well, there are some real historical examples. Uh, John Snow, for example, not this one, but a long time ago in London, John Snow did something quite famous. He built the, um, the cholera map which uh, attempted to work out why people were dying from this terrible disease. They didn't really understand the, the transmission mechanisms. So he took a um, very scientific statistical approach. He actually made a map of deaths per household and plotted that um, versus location. And he used that map to then identify a polluted pump where X marks the spot. And it was quite interesting because there were some outliers as well. It turned out that there was a brewery right next to the pump. Uh, but brewers actually don't drink pump water, they drink beer, not surprisingly. Um, so with location, you first have to know where you are. And to usefully represent location, you need a couple of things, a coordinate system, a map, and a scale. The sky is not going to get much help from that map. This is a better one. It's got lat long coordinates. Uh, it's got a scale. And it's got some interesting things, like um, the bulk of the treasure is here. It's the Treasure Island map. Uh, so I was thinking about geospatial anomaly detection as a sort of a new problem. Um, so rather than the single ID, the events coming into my system now have a location and a value. So the problem now becomes finding the nearest 50 events uh, to each new event coming in and still doing it quickly. 
the problem is you can't really make any assumptions about geospatial properties of events, uh, including the actual location, density, or distribution, uh, i.e. where or how many there are. Um, so you need to search from the smallest to increasingly larger areas. Um, so some anomalies, are, special anomalies, are actually enormous. So the South Atlantic geomagnetic anomaly on this picture here is, is huge. Um, at ApacheCon US last year, there was a very interesting talk by some of the, the Uber people. Um, they actually have a very similar um, sort of technology stack um, and, uh, and a slightly different use case. Um, but they actually try and forecast demand. Um, at the problem that they have is that they have to then increase the area um, until they have sufficient data to make accurate predictions about where demand um, an hour or two ahead might, might be. So it's a similar sort of problem. So I thought, well, can we use that long as the Cassandra partition key? That's the obvious way of introducing the, um, the geospatial data to my problem. Well, the answer is yes, compound partition keys are allowed, but you can only select the exact locations, which um, yeah, may not be all that useful. So you have to then introduce the concept of nearness, how to compute nearness. To compute near the distance between locations, you need a coordinate system, obviously. Um, you guys are familiar with lots of different um, coordinate systems. The Mercator map is a common one, uh, but unfortunately it's flat earth and introduces lots of nasty distortion like near the poles. Um, the Antarctic, I don't think, is actually that big in practice. Um, so in reality, the world is at least approximately spherical. Um, unfortunately, the calculation of distance between two that long points is non-trivial, and there's the maths. Databases aren't um, particularly good at doing complicated maths like that. Uh, so often there's a simpler approach used, the bounding box. This is an approximation of distance using inequalities. Uh, it's a lot simpler to compute. Uh, it's a lot faster. So can you use bounding boxes and Cassandra? Um, or you can, you can use, um, essentially I've already been using country as a partition key um, and the lat long time as the clustering keys, but you can't run the query with multiple inequalities. Um, so there's an example of a table uh, and the query to select data using a bounding box. Unfortunately, you get an error message back uh, from the server. Um, so it, it looked like it might work, but it doesn't actually work in practice. So Cassandra has a whole bunch of uh, secondary indexes, they're called. Would they help us? Well, possibly. Um, the, the problem is choosing the right one. Uh, the default secondary indexes enable you to create uh, an index on, say, the latitude, and then another separate index on the longitude, but unfortunately we have the same restrictions as the clustering columns in the previous example. Um, there's a different type of secondary index system called SASI, uh, which stands for SS Table Attached Secondary Index, a bit of a mouthful. It does, uh, in theory, support more complex queries more efficiently. Um, there's a couple of examples of creating two SASI indexes on the lat long and a query. Um, uh, does it work? Well, sort of. And it turns out reading the documentation that um, you need this thing called allow filtering, which in Cassandra is considered quite bad in, in the production environment. Um, so essentially the data has got to be filtered first before the results are returned. So it can be horribly inefficient if many rows have to be retrieved prior to filtering. Uh, but then oddly enough, the SASE documents themselves, that even though you have to have that allow filtering, there's no filtering actually going on. So I really didn't understand what, what was happening there. Um, anyway, we, we tried it and that was our first lot of results with the, um, the lat long data added. As you can see, the results from a performance perspective were not very encouraging. We were getting less than 1% of the base level results at that point. Um, so this is probably not the correct solution if you care about performance. Okay, another approach that seemed pretty obvious uh, initially, at least, was geohashes. Um, I'd already sort of divided the map into named hierarchical areas um, using the country partition. Uh, other examples that are quite interesting include things like plate tectonics, which are actually hierarchical ways of dividing up the, um, the world based on the plates, which is pretty cool. Um, so geohashes, essentially, they're just rectangular areas with a variable length 
base32 string. Um, a single character region is about 5,000 kilometers by 5,000 kilometers. And each letter, uh, extra letter, gives another 32 sub areas. So an eight character long geohash is an area about 40 meters by 20 meters. Um, so what you have to do is encode or decode your lat long to and from the geohash before you use it. Um, similar to other coordinate systems, obviously there are other there's sort of edge cases and it is non-linear near the poles as well. Uh, and so interestingly enough, some geohashes are actual words. So ketchup is uh, in Africa somewhere. Uh, it's an area 153 meters by 153 meters. Trump is in Kazakhstan. Uh, he's not to scale in this picture. He's five kilometers, five kilometers, yep, yeah, by five kilometers. Um, yep, okay. So what do I have to do to modify my application for geohashes? Well, it's pretty simple. You just encode that long as geohash. Um, the geohash becomes the new key. So everywhere in the application where I write data or read it, I'm now using the geohash as the key. Um, yeah, the geohash is used to query Cassandra. Um, not surprisingly, again, there's a few different ways of actually using geohashes and Cassandra. Um, option one is multiple indexed geohash columns. Look, some of these um, options in hindsight are a bit silly, but I, I, at the time I was trying everything I could think of. <laughs> so it was sort of an exhaustive approach. Um, people that were more expert in data modeling for Cassandra would have said, oh, that's silly, or this is the correct way, right way, but anyway. Um, so in theory, geohashes are, are well known as working quite well for database indexes. So this was at least a half sensible approach. Um, so there's an example of how you do that. It's got multiple um, indexes. Uh, basically, you, to use it, you then have to run multiple queries, selecting from the smallest to the largest areas and just stop when you get 50 rows um, of data returned. The trade-offs include having multiple secondary columns and indexes, multiple queries, um, the accuracy and the number of queries depends on the spatial distribution and density, which is all a bit tricky. Uh, the results, however, are slightly better than our first attempt. So we're getting about 10% of the base level results now using this approach. Um, second option is denormalization denormalize multiple tables. In fact, um, so denormalization is actually pretty normal in Cassandra. This is the, the de facto correct solution in Cassandra. Uh, it doesn't have joins, it's a NoSQL database. So every time you think, oh, I need data in a slightly different format or copies of it, that's great. That's exactly what Cassandra's designed for. It's got really efficient and cheap um, write performance. So you really have to design it um, with the reads in mind. So what I did was create eight tables uh, one for each uh, distinct geo hash length. Then you select from the smallest to the largest areas using the corresponding table. Again, there's some trade-offs involved in that as well. Ah, and the results, we're getting better results. We're now up to 20% of the, the baseline throughput. So we're heading in the right direction. Uh, the final option with geo hashes was to use clustering columns. Uh, it's very similar to option one, but using um, the, the clustering feature, which is essentially the ordering mechanism within partitions in Cassandra. So there's an example of creating the table. Uh, I've got a query here, I think. Nope, I'm going to explain how it works. Um, clustering columns are really good for hierarchical data. Um, they're good for modeling and efficient querying of hierarchical or nested data. Uh, there's a few constraints. The query must include the higher level columns with the equality operator. Ranges are only allowed on the last column in the query and lower level columns don't have to be included. So there's an example of a permitted um, query. But then again, why have multiple clustering columns when one is actually sufficient? So a better solution is to use geohash eight and time as the clustering key. So there's an example of that, it's a lot simpler. Um, there's the inequality range queries. Again, you have to start um, with smaller areas and stop when you get 50 back again. And this gives us quite a significantly uh, better result than the previous attempt. So we're up to 34% of the base line throughput now with this approach. Uh, there's a whole bunch of issues potentially. Um, the main one really is this um, trade-off between space versus time. Um, you can have different scales for 
for the temporal axis and the, te the spatial scale. Um, so you just have to watch out for that. So the final option that we'll have a, a look at is another well-known solution for Cassandra, um, Cassandra Apache Leucine Index Plugin. Uh, Cassa Cassandra Leucine Index is a plugin for Apache Cassandra. Uh, basically extends the index functionality to provide near real-time search, including full text search capabilities, uh, multi-variable and geospatial and by temporal search. So it's quite powerful. Um, we actually support this plugin now. We've taken it over and maintain it. So it's available on our GitHub there. Um, so it's got very rich geospatial semantics, including a whole bunch of things, which we'll have a look at a few examples. Again, the, the, we're sort of spoiled for choice here, so it wasn't obvious which ones uh, would work better. Um, first of all, the GeoPoint example, under the hood indexing is done using a tree structure with geohashes anyway, with configurable precision. So we're actually using geohashes by using a GeoPoint in Lucene. Uh, there's multiple search options we can sort. It's got very sophisticated but quite complex uh, semant semantics for sorting. Uh, we could build a, um, uh, we could, yeah, we could use a, a building box, it's called, a B box filter. Uh, you have to then compute the box corners in order to use this, of course. Um, or there's a geo distance filter as well, which is, um, which is of arbitrary precision and therefore more accurate as well. Uh, oh, finally, there's not yet again another option, the prefix filter. Uh, this is useful for searching large areas over a single geohash column as you can search for a substring. So it turns out that geohashes and prefixes actually are sort of made for each other in a sense. Uh, so finally, some results. Uh, the leucine results added to the previous ones gave us between 2 and 25% of the base level results. The best one is the prefix filter that I just mentioned. Um, none of them are as good as, um, as the geohash option three though. Uh, so overall, here are the results. Um, the two geohash options are certainly the best, giving 25%, 34% of the, the initial throughput. So at 34%, that would give us 6.5 billion anonymity checks a day, which is, isn't um, too bad. Uh, the Lucene bounded box and geo distance um, approaches were certainly the most accurate, but only gave 5% of the baseline performance and so not great, unfortunately. Um, how are we going for time? We've got another few minutes. Um, I'll just mention the 3D problem. So the world isn't just flat, although- What? The world's not it. flat? No, no, sorry to break anyone's misconceptions here, but yeah, you do have to worry about the Sort of other other things apart from you get ten minutes. You get ten minutes before the session. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll I'll be done in five. So you can all go <laughs> no, home early. Discuss. Great. Okay. Uh, whether I'm awake enough for that, it's not so sure. I think I've left my coffee go cold here. Actually. Oh. Mm. Okay. Um. So what have we got here? Location, altitude, and volume. So you can actually have three D geo hashes. Uh, they represent 2D location, and then adding altitude gives you volume, which is quite useful potentially. Um, here's an example of a potential 3D geohash. I didn't work out what the value would be, but uh, this is a cube of all the Earth's water in one sort of suspended location. Uh, what sort of applications would you have for a 3D geohash? Well, Recently, I think it was Google was, was doing the world's first trial of drone delivery in Canberra. So that was a slightly bizarre experience. Um, so it's quite useful for drones to have proximity detection that are in 3D, obviously. And so I was looking at the, the rules around the world for drone usage, and there's an example, I think this is from the UK. Um, so there's a whole bunch of rules. Uh, you can only be 50 meters from people and property, 150 meters from congested areas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and interestingly enough, they correspond pretty closely to different link 3D geohashes. So that, that could be a potential application. Uh, how would we add 3D geohashes to our application? Well, essentially the 3, 3D geohash works with all the geohash index options that I've highlighted in green on that graph. Uh, so they give you a reasonably fast way to compute 3D proximity. Um, of course, for any of these solutions, if you if you did want to go for some of the slower ones due to accuracy or other reasons, 
Uh, with Cassandra, of course, it's very simple to improve performance. You just add more nodes to the cluster and you get linear um, performance improvement. So there is another sort of backup plan. Uh, okay, that's basically the end of the talk. If you want more information, I've got my demo 3D geohash Java code in the GitHub there. Um, it's not production ready, uh, but it does produce valid 3D geohashes for altitudes from 13 kilometers below the sea level uh, up to geostationary satellite orbit altitudes. Um, and it can be used um, with the Cassandra indexes as I've demonstrated. Uh, I've got about 54 blogs now on various um, Apache technologies. Um, that I've written over the last three years, if you're interested in having a look. And there's a lot more details on the geospatial aspect as well. I think there were about four blogs, in fact, that, um, that I went through some of the more, the more details of how this works. And finally, if you want to try out some of these open source technologies in a slightly bigger um, context to what you can run on, on your, your um, laptop, uh, you can spin up some trial clusters of Cassandra and Kafka uh, and Elasticsearch and Kibana and things like that on our website. I think there's a two week trial period and you just have to go to our website and click on the free trial button and away you go. Um, that's all for me. Thanks uh, for listening. I hope that that was an interesting sort of um, crossover between geospatial stuff and some of the sort of the big data technologies. Um, and hopefully some of that might be useful. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Paul. And uh... Not only for the technical content, but also the color uh, in terms of the, <laughs> the interludes on different topics, not just the flat earth one. But, uh, well, I had a look at some of your guys' talks um, in the, the Google uh, Drive yesterday as well. And yes, I noticed the geospatial track has a lot more interesting pictures in general, I think, than some of the more, <laughs> more focused technical tracks. So that's one of the attractions for me as well as um, sort of being able to do something a bit interesting visually. So, so we got some chat. Um, questions. I don't know if you see those as well. Super uh, cool. Okay, we um, but did you cover any of the boundary issues with geohashes, such as crossing mm. boundaries? No. Look for the for the use case that I had, and it was a synthetic one. I admit that. Um, so I didn't do any functional testing to see whether it was producing the correct results with the geohash addition. Uh, um, but it's certainly something you have to be aware of, and. And I guess for the anomaly detection use case, um, speed was of the essence. Uh, and getting a few false positives and things may, may not be so critical. Um, but yeah, you would have. I think you would certainly have to tune it for a real uh, application based on on actual knowledge of the distribution and um, location of of interest. Um, yep, that's certainly a trade off. And then you got one about uh, have you tried H3, the Uber uh, discrete oh, Uber okay. system? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I heard about that last year at the Uber talk. So that's, um, yep. yeah. So H3 indexing sounded interesting. Um, no, I haven't tried it. Um, yep. No, that, there certainly are a lot of other options. Um, and so, yes, the answer is no to that one. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure what, what the trade offs would be again for that one, but certainly worth looking at. H3 is a good one, and of course, it's um, uh, one of a general class of what's called discrete global grid systems, which is a mm -hmm. set that uh, actually Australia um, has been the leader in international standards about, um, and at this point is beginning to go beyond 2D surface of the earth, you know, cells on the surface in nice uniform mm. ways to what you're trying to do, what you're doing in, in 3D mm. and also in 4D. And so, oh, wow, okay. Actually, a gentleman out of uh, New Zealand um, has uh, uh, done really good work. And I, I, in fact, I'll find a link and put it in the chat. But uh, oh, okay. uh, well, applying that in, um, you know, Cassandra and the like, that's I'm not aware of. So that would be a great mashup of 3D mm -hmm. discrete global grids, or even 4D, in Cassandra, mm -hmm. as you've shown, would be a very interesting um, uh, activity. Mm, okay. I, I'm just sort of a curious question as well as, I mean, how many people in the geospatial community use some of the big data technologies like Cassandra and Kafka? Is, is the size of the problem um, big enough to use some of these technologies or can you get away with using some of the slightly less scalable technologies? 
yes, <laughs> Jason just came in as well, and Stephen. Um, yeah, and and that's why you know this uh, track. I think, uh, in fact, the first geospatial track began mm. in Apache Big Data back in 2016, and and so there was uh, uh, you know back then uh, clear that uh, the the mashup mm. of uh, Apache Big Data uh -huh. with geospatial and geospatial. I'm a geospatial guy, so. Um, you know, geospatial mm. is the first original big data, is what I will tell you. Uh, the remote sensing right, okay. is the first big yep. data, right? And so, uh, absolutely, mm. Uh, mm. not to say everything's done, but uh, you know, things like uh, GeoMesa and others, uh, HBase, mm. Kilo, mm. Kafka, uh, you know, a bunch of them. Um, you know, Elastic presented last uh, last year, that kind of thing. But um, you know, exactly the kinds of things you're pointing out is good. Uh, mm. A good indication. Mm -hmm. So, um, remote yeah, no, testing I think that, was that big makes data sense. before big data was cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, as I discovered, I mean, it's quite hard adding geospatial stuff um, to the big data technologies, and even they struggle with the the throughput aspects. Um, so, yeah, the more grunt you've got, the better <laughs> for a lot of the stuff. So. Um, uh, yes, I noticed something about GeoMesa. I haven't tried GeoMesa, but it does seem to have a, a really nice fit with Cassandra. And I have mentioned this to some of our um, people a few times, whether it's worth us trying to uh, support it or at least test it out as well. So yeah, thanks for that that suggestion. Oh, and GeoWave, OK. Yep. And yeah, Elastic, um, so actually the talk I gave yesterday morning was sort of like a sponsored talk. But nevertheless, I encountered some geospatial challenges getting some data from the, the US NOAA tidal rest services into uh, Elasticsearch Kibana. There was quite a lot of um, transformation required uh, to actually make Kibana aware of the, the geospatial dimensions of the data and then show it on a map. So that wasn't as straightforward as I, as I, as I was hoping, even for a, a technology like that. Where was that talk? You said you did one yesterday? Oh, that was, so that was um, an ApacheCon sponsored talk. So that was done in, in our um, Instaplaster booth in your booth. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Definitely interested in that talk. Uh, if there's a way to share that, we can add it into the. There is a geospatial, geospatial Apache Con channel, but that's going to disappear here in a few hours. Um, mm. Oh wow. There, okay. wow. there is a geospatial at Apache.org mailing list, and so mm. Uh, mm. if you want to join that and uh, contribute oh, okay. uh, to geospatial, if, if, mm. if Somebody was asking in the last session that there ought to be a web page for Apache Geospatial. That may end up mm -hmm. happening, but right now we got a, a reflector, mail reflector, right? So, uh, oh, yes, okay. uh, yep. so yep. uh, urge that. Yep. Mm, okay. So we got now oh, maybe 15, well, 15 seconds or something before we got a birds of a feather that'll start in five minutes. Okay. Well, great. Uh, okay. Anything else you want to bring to us, Paul? Uh, I think that's about it from me. Um, I, yeah, I don't know when I'll be doing anything specifically geospatial next, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly try and uh, keep track of what, what you guys are up to and might see you again in person, hopefully maybe even next year. We'll have to see what happens. So. Uh, we can always dream that, you know, someday we'll get out of our caves, right? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, again, thank you, Paul. Very entertaining. Oh, that's right. Well, thanks for inviting me. And that's a great experience, Batchicon, and nice meeting people from everywhere and lots of different disciplines as well so thank you so go to the sessions page uh yep. and go to the birds of a feather and everybody can join right. and talk there so we'll see all right you. okay see you bye everyone <laughs>